Welcome to Spinard, the shadiest place in Anchorage. Or, well, that's the reputation. No, actually, it was the reputation. They've cleaned this place up a little while back. But you know, there's still this sense of sleaze and weirdness just permeating the neighborhood nowadays. I mean, this is where all the city strip clubs and bars and pawn shops used to be. And it's also home to some of the more popular businesses here in town. I mean, that uh, theater pub place from the Snake Eater episode is right down the street. It's kind of disgusting, but there's also something kind of homely about it. This place has this weird, nostalgic pull that I can't seem to escape. Everyone is a bit surly, but they know your name. It can be intimidating, but to those who know Spinard, it's a pretty welcoming neighborhood. Uh, every building has history. Fun, weird, stupid history. Likewise, the game we're about to talk about today has a kind of edge to it. People are unfriendly to you, almost to a comedic degree. But, you know, if you stick with it, it grows on you. And it turns out that, like Spinard, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door has some really interesting stories to tell you. First of all, to address the obvious thing, almost everything this game does, Undertale does better. This game was going to be way up in the original top 10 list, but then Undertale came out and changed a lot of that stuff. I'll admit that up front. But at the same time, I couldn't not do an episode on Thousand Year Door. It was one of my favorite games growing up. It dared to explore stuff that not many other games I had played back then did. It was a huge influence on me as a person, and perhaps even the biggest influence outside of Metroid Prime, which, well, nothing's touching Metroid Prime. The sense of humor, the atmosphere, the combat, the characters, the element of surprise that later inspired Undertale, and a grizzled bob sea captain with a tragic backstory and a weathered beard. As I said, I couldn't not talk about this game. It's got so much good stuff in it. But, as with anything, I should begin with first impressions, because picture 11-year-old innocent Paper Mario 64 fanboy me popping in this game for the first time. Get to Rogue Port, meet cute Goomba partner, fight fun tutorial boss, okay, this game's pretty cool. Whoa! Is that a noose in the middle of the town square? Is this a Mario game? Right off the bat, the player is thrown off by the fact that there are freaking gallows in the town square here. It's literally one of the first things players see in the game, and that noose sets the tone for the entire rest of the game. I don't mean that people drop like flies left and right though. This game isn't particularly sad or somber. Well, not most of the time. Instead, the player's introduction to Rogueport sets them up for a subversive and blackly humorous adventure. It's a less wholesome adventure than any other Mario game, but not really in an edgy way. It's in more of an honest, almost kind of Simpsons way. The happy toads in Toad Town are replaced with thieves and shopkeepers just trying to get by. Unlike the homely first toad house you wake up in in Paper Mario 64, the first inn you visit is dirty and cheap, and also not free. But again, it's not all doom and gloom. The characters have issues that they need to work out, but they also have charm. The whole game has a tough, enjoyable attitude, right down to the old lady chef who chews you out for stepping on her contacts. It's not just Rogueport, just about every nook and cranny of this world is bursting with personality. Petal Meadows borrows the whole senile mayor with a dark secret shtick from the first Paper Mario. Glitzville makes for an awesome parody of the WWE. Twilight Town, for all its creepiness, is actually full of legitimately sweet people. The Excess Express is filled with snooty aristocrats. And let's not forget the great and glorious bob -omb Cannon homeland. Explode well for great exploration of moon and interference of Mushroom Kingdom elections. Okay, point is, this is a far cry from Nintendo's traditional level design philosophy. I'm sure you've heard people talk about how for Nintendo, form follows function. The levels in Splatoon look like 90s skater parks because they tie in with the graffiti gameplay. We want Donkey Kong going on this massive roller coaster ride, so let's put him in a minecart. The shrines in Breath of the Wild all look the same because, let's face it, it'd be really hard to hand make 120 mini dungeons and make them all look unique. 
look, none of that is bad, of course. Hell, Breath of the Wild is my favorite Zelda game. But when the core gameplay of your game consists of back and forth, turn-based battles, there's not a lot you can do to make the game really aesthetically match that. Actually, I take that back. The battle screen incentivizes stylish play, so of course it looks like a theater. And that's cool, but that's beside the point. The worlds in this game, aside from a few scenarios here and there, don't really match up with the gameplay in any significant way. It wouldn't make any sense to find a pair of butt stomp shoes in the middle of an old tree, nor would it to solve Agatha Christie mysteries with a talking penguin in a game where the primary gameplay engagement is classic turn-based RPG combat. I really do hate to say it, but I think it's the truth. There's not a whole lot you can do to make an old-school turn-based RPG system interesting anymore. There are exceptions, of course. Undertale shifts the focus from attacking over and over again to trying to solve the enemy's problems. And Persona 5 makes it look really, really slick. Review pending, I promise. But even if the battles look slick in Persona, you're still only hitting monsters with their weakness, knocking them down, and then either asking them to join you or playing the cool all-out attack movie, and then going back to the overworld. It looks fantastic, but there's only so many times you can watch it before you're begging to stop grinding and go back to mundanity, where the real content is at. It's kind of the same case in Thousand Year Door. Yes, the game does incentivize cool button presses and maybe even a little bit of improv here and there to find out where the stylish timings are, but in the end, you're still taking turns attacking each other for the most part. And if that were the game's primary form of engagement, the game as a whole would not have left that much of an impression on me. But thankfully, it's not the only form of engagement. The game is too busy showing you how different it can be from any other game on the market, and the effect is so good that you end up ignoring a lot of those flaws. Remember what I said back in my Deus Ex video? But even though this game does have serious flaws, I still love it to bits. A lot of people do. That's something that I don't think a lot of people understand about criticism, that even if a game does have serious flaws and problems, if it has that shining heart underneath, then all those flaws are just kind of meaningless. That still stands. Thousand Year Door does not have the best combat system out there. In terms of JRPGs, there are games that look better and play better, as Undertale can attest. But people still love this game. Hell, a few call it one of Nintendo's best, and for a game that isn't groundbreaking on the gameplay front, that's a real shocker. The worlds are so different, the writing is different, the atmosphere is different. It just feels like a cut from a totally different animal than Nintendo. The heart of Thousand Year Door is so wildly unlike any other Nintendo game. It's not as playful as any of Nintendo's games, nor does it feel as epic or grand. Uh, it's humorous, but with a twinge of sadness and violence. It's not outright unlikable, but it's not afraid of showing the player some pretty ugly stuff. Like the noose in the Rogueport Square, or Mario's run-in with the Mafia, or basically the entire final act of the game. There's a heart of gold here, but not like pure, shiny, clean gold. It's a little grimy, a little dusty, but that kind of makes it more like an actual heart. Hearts aren't shiny. I don't know where this metaphor is going. Actually, you know what? Picture this. If the GameCube were a daycare, you'd have Mario Kart playing with toy cars, a couple Mario Sunshine kids shooting each other with super soakers, Metroid Prime out in the playground enjoying the outdoors and totally getting a gold star, maybe Rogue Squadron 2 sitting in the corner pretend flying toy spaceships around. All good fun in their own right. But Thousand Year Door is the kid drawing strangely violent stuff with a pack of crayons, or antagonizing the other kids by making admittedly funny jokes about them. Maybe the daycare manager would send Thousand Year Door's parents an angry letter about how they're troubled or something. But some of us adults would look at that Thousand Year Door kid and think, man, me too, almost in a Lilo and Stitch kind of way. Most of Nintendo's games feel like toys, but Thousand Year Door feels like a genuine kid. Funny, scary, and probably not right in the head, but I wouldn't have it any other way. This isn't something you just see in the more serious moments of the game. You see it in the hilarious, almost downright sadistic dialogue options that the game sometimes gives you. You see it when people in the rogue port streets give you a bit of sass. Hell, all of Chapter 4 is basically running back and forth because this ghost keeps trolling you. And you know what? When you try and type in that ghost's name and find out that the sick degenerate has removed the letter P from your keyboard, you almost admire the guy for making you backtrack through the grindiest area of the game like three times. It's like when a kid plays a prank on you and it's so good that you're both pissed off and also laughing at how good it was. 
The entire game has that kind of mischievous edge. These chests could have just given you cool new abilities, but no, they take the time and pretend that they've given you a horrible curse. The game could just tell you what was in the ghost's diary on the XS Express, but why resist an opportunity to make a joke at the player's expense? Hell, even when the game starts ramping up the scare factor at the very end, there's still a bit of a playful side to it. Accepting the Queen's offer kicks you into an anticlimactic non-ending and forces you to watch the entire non-skippable cutscene all over again. But rather than seeming really malicious, Thousand Year Door still has that dirty, dusty heart of gold underneath. Mario isn't a perfect protagonist here like he is in many other Mario games. He gets afraid, he falls asleep when his brother starts droning on, and cruel dialogue options be damned, he's willing to help others in need. He feels like an actual person, rather than just a blank slate for the player. And when the game is ready to take things seriously, it does so. The whole scene with Bobbery is handled with such grace and humidity, and it makes Bobbery so much better as a character, and oh god, hang on, I need a minute. Oh man, uh, fuck, okay. The same is also true of the other characters, like Vivian. Even without the transgender context that was removed for the American version of the game, yeah, transgender issues in a Nintendo game, who to thunk it, everybody can sympathize with being that one person in a group that doesn't quite fit in, who always kinda takes the brunt of the abuse. Seeing her mature throughout the first half of the game and realize that her relationship with her sisters really isn't healthy is one of the most gratifying things I've ever seen in a game. Again, that's without any of the transgender context. Outside of America, the other party members take her in and accept her as who she really is. That had to have been a really gutsy move for a video game, especially a video game from 2004. So, you gotta admire that. And of course, as I mentioned in the Undertale video, I was 11 when I first ran into the Shadow Queen and... Ugh. Seeing a beloved childhood character get possessed by a demon is a good way to scar a kid for life. Hell, the whole final chapter is a little freaky. After seven other chapters of exploring pirate caves, professional wrestling tournaments, moon bases, and other really cool places, the game takes a jarring turn into creepy and unsettling. The atmosphere really sells the idea of an ancient, untouched sanctum of pure evil. Especially this last room before the final boss rush, when the color palette changes and the music just suddenly goes silent. That freaked the hell out of me when I was a kid, and I had played Metroid Prime up to that point. Like, you know that scene in Undertale where you're eating dinner with Sans and he just very suddenly tells you he could kill you where you stand? Where you suddenly realize that this jokey, funny guy is actually really genuinely dangerous? Yeah, imagine that in room form. In a Mario game. I've talked at length before about how Paper Mario as a series, and also a few other games, are sometimes defined by the element of surprise. They appear unassuming on the surface, but once you pop them in and start playing, they use that kind of humorous, scary, or sad shock value to reinforce their themes. Undertale does this really well. It wouldn't be my second favorite game if it didn't. The Steam store page makes it look like just another pixel art RPG, but once you start playing, it plays with those expectations to make you think about RPG design, pacifism, morality, and family. Thousand Year Door doesn't dedicate itself to those themes as deeply as Undertale does, but it still effectively plays with your expectations about a Mario game. After all, this game can make you laugh, cry, or even wither in fear. But who would expect that from a Mario game of all places? That makes its emotional effect on the player even stronger. It's like going to a Disney movie and unexpectedly being treated to a story about racial prejudice. Or going to a Captain America movie only to find a complex narrative wherein Cap can no longer identify with American ideals. They could have made any old crime drama or political thriller, but when you throw recognizable faces and talent like Disney or Captain America behind it for the sake of defying audience expectations, it has a much greater impact. You've effectively taken something the audience is used to and placed that into a situation that is far deeper and more nuanced than they're probably used to. You could see it as a way of easing the audience out of their comfort zone, but this messing with expectations could also be a tool to force audiences to think critically about stories and settings that they're used to. Or, it could make the emotion within the story resonate more deeply with the audience. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door does all those things, and I find it fascinating that it did so a mere three or four years after the first Paper Mario came out. 
The first Paper Mario is also fun, but it wasn't nearly as subversive as its sequel. Story and character-wise, it was a pretty standard Mario adventure. It's also fascinating because the gameplay in Paper Mario is very simple compared to other RPGs at the time, making it a good entry point for very young people who want to play an RPG. Like I was, when I first played it at age 8. Mario is a franchise that many children are intimately familiar with, especially now that he's got his own mobile game. So even at a really young age, people have expectations regarding this character and this setting. So imagine a small kid, hot off his favorite Mario game, playing the Thousand Year Door for the first time three years later. Those deep-rooted expectations are exploited here for real emotional value. And it's even more effective since it's with a character that's been with them since the beginning of their gaming lives. That's the kind of thing that leaves an impact. A part of me debates whether this game is really as good as other JRPGs or if I just experienced it at the right time. I like to think both. This game is both well-designed and well-written, but it becomes so much more so with those nostalgic expectations of other Mario games. The characters in this game are vivid and wonderful. The narrative is straightforward but packed with twists, clever jokes, and some genuine emotional weight. It's willing to make fun of itself and also willing to dip its toes into some real nightmare fuel and black humor. If Thousand Year Door were a person, we'd question their sanity. We'd complain about their jokes, and we'd probably be a little worried about their sense of humor, but we would love them all the same. Not a lot of games feel as human as Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Not a lot of games have that flawed, grimy, and also pure and enjoyable soul. Sometimes it's those kinds of games that we really need. A big part of that is nostalgia, but under my circumstances, this game still resonates with me. And it still resonates with a lot of people. It'll stand the test of time because it tested so many people on their love of Mario, and it'll continue to do so for young audiences still discovering Mario today. It plays with those expectations in a memorable and impactful way, and it'll continue to do so as long as Mario's around. So here's to you, you lovable, scary, funny, sad mess of a game you. We love you. Don't ever change.